argument. As a matter of fact, we have been uh, seeing fewer and fewer undocumented immigrants uh, streaming across the border. We're talking about a 75 percent decrease since 2000. Um, the reality when it comes to illicit drugs in this country is by and large when they are stopped, they are stopped at legal ports of entry. Uh, they are smuggled in in vehicles stopped at legal ports of entry or smuggled in in uh, airplanes stopped at airports. And the other thing is, is that the number of undocumented immigrants in the U.S., it's at a 12 year low. These are all arguments that the administration will have to ha deal with should there be any sort of legal pushback. All right, so you can see the president's coming out right now. We're going to take you to a CBS News, CBS special, News report. special report. I'm John Dickerson in New York. We're about to hear from President Trump addressing what the White House calls the national Thank security much, and humanitarian crisis. Here's the president. Before we begin, I'd like to just say that we have a large team of very talented people. In China, we've had a uh, negotiation going on for about two days. It's going extremely well. Who knows what that means, because it only matters if we get it done. But we're uh, very much uh, working very closely with China and President Xi, who I respect a lot. Very good relationship that we have. And we're a lot closer than we ever were in this country with having a real trade deal. We're covering everything, all of the points that people have been talking about for years that said couldn't be done, whether it was theft or uh, anything, anything. The unfairness. Uh, we've been losing, on average, $375 billion a year with China. A lot of people think it's $506 billion. Some people think it's much more than that. We're going to be leveling the playing field. Uh, the tariffs are hurting China very badly. They don't want them. And frankly, if we can make the deal, it'd be my honor to remove them. But otherwise, we're having many billions of dollars pouring into our Treasury. We've never had that before with China. It's been very much of a one-way street. So that's happening. And uh, the relationship with China is very good. But I think they finally respect our country. They haven't respected us for a long time. Not for a long time. Uh, the U.K. and the U.S., as you probably have been seeing and hearing, we're agreeing to go forward and preserve our trade agreement. You know all of the situation with respect to Brexit and the complexity and the problems. But we have a very good trading relationship with U.K., and that's just been uh, strengthened further. So with the U.K., we're continuing our trade. And uh, we are going to actually be increasing it very substantially as time goes by. We expect that the U.K. will be uh, very, very substantially increased as it relates to trade with the United States. The relationship there also is very good. We have a lot of uh, great announcements having to do with Syria and our success with the eradication of the caliphate, and that'll be announced over the next uh, 24 hours, and many other things. A lot of positive things are going on. We're working on a, uh, a summit, and you know all about the summit. It'll be in Vietnam, Hanoi, and uh, we will we'll be meeting in Hanoi. I think a lot of you will be going, I suspect. And I hope we have the same good luck as we had in the first summit. A lot was done in the first summit. No more rockets going up, no more missiles going up, no more testing of nuclear. Get back our remains, the remains of our great heroes from the Korean War. And we got back our hostages. But uh, we hope we're going to be very much equally as successful. I'm in no rush for speed. We just don't want testing. The sanctions, as you know, remain. Uh, everything is remaining. China's been helping us. And Russia's been helping us. And South Korea, I think you can say, has been uh, — we've been working very closely with South Korea, with Japan. But uh, China, Russia on the border have really been at least partially living up to what they're supposed to be doing. And that's okay, as per the United Nations. So we will uh, have a meeting on the 27th and 28th of February. And I think that will be a very successful one. I look forward to seeing Chairman Kim 
We have also established a very good relationship, which has never happened between him or his family in the United States. Uh, they have really taken advantage of the United States. Billions of dollars have been paid to them. And uh, we, uh, we won't let that happen, but we think that North Korea and Chairman Kim have a tremendous potential as an economic force, economic power. Their location between South Korea and then Russia and China, right smack in the middle, is phenomenal. And we think they have a uh, great chance for tremendous economic prosperity in the future. So I look forward to seeing Chairman Kim in Vietnam. Today, I'm announcing uh, several critical actions that my administration is taking to confront a problem that we have right here at home. We fight wars that are 6,000 miles away, wars that we should have never been in, in many cases, but we don't control our own border. So we're going to confront the national security crisis on our southern border, and we're going to do it one way or the other. We have to do it. Not because it was a campaign promise, which it is, it was one of many, by the way, my, not my only one. We're rebuilding the military. Our economy is thriving like never before. You look at other economies, they're doing terribly, and we're doing phenomenally. The market is up tremendously today. Not that that's anything but, you know, because I'll go back in and they'll say, oh, the market just went down. But the market is uh, getting close to the new highs that we created. We, uh, we have all the records. We have every record, but we're getting close to that point again where we'll create new records. So our country is doing very well economically, and uh, we've done a lot. But one of the things I said I have to do and I want to do is border security, because we have tremendous amounts of drugs flowing into our country, much of it coming from the southern border. When you look and when you listen to politicians, uh, in particular certain Democrats, they say it all comes through the Port of entry. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's just a lie. It's all a lie. They say walls don't work. Walls work 100 uh, percent. Whether it's El Paso, I, I really was smiling because the other night I was in El Paso. We had a tremendous crowd, and a tremendous crowd. And I asked the people, many of whom were from El Paso, but they came from all over Texas. And I asked them, I said, let me ask you, the uh, as a crowd, when the wall went up, was it better? You, you were there, some of you. It was not only better, it was like 100 percent better. You know what they did. But that's only one example. There are so many examples. In El Paso, they have close to 2,000 murders right on the other side of the wall. And they had 23 murders. It's a lot of murders. But it's not close to 2,000 murders right on the other side of the wall in Mexico. So everyone knows that walls work, and there are better examples than El Paso, frankly. You just take a look almost everywhere. Take a look at Israel. They're building another wall. Their wall is 99.9 percent .9 effective, they told me. 99.9 percent. .9%. That's what it would be with us, too. The only weakness is they go to a wall, and then they go around the wall. They go around the wall and in. Okay? That's what it is. Very simple. And a big majority of the big drugs, the big drug loads, don't go through ports of entry. They can't go through ports of entry. You can't take big loads because you have people. We have some very capable people, the Border Patrol, law enforcement, looking. You can't take human traffic, women and girls. You can't take them through ports of entry. You can't have them tied up in the back seat of a car or a truck or a van. They open the door. They look. They can't see three women with tape in their mouth or three women whose hands are tied. They go through areas where you have no wall. Everybody knows that. Nancy knows it. Chuck knows it. They all know it. It's all a big lie. It's a big con game. You don't have to be very smart to know. You put up a barrier, the people come in, and that's it. They can't do anything unless they walk left or right and they find an area where there's no barrier, and they come into the United States. Welcome. We've detained more people. Our border agents are doing such incredible work. Our military has been incredible. We put up 
barbed wire on top of certain old walls that were there. We fixed the wall and we loaded up with barbed wire. It's very successful. But our military has been fantastic, and I want to thank them. And it's very necessary. We've broken up two caravans that are on their way. They just are breaking. They're in the process of breaking up. We have another one that we haven't been able to break up yet. We've been actually working with Mexico much better than ever before. I want to thank the President. I want to thank Mexico. They have their own problems. They have the largest number of murders that they've ever had in their history. Almost 40,000 murders. 40,000! And they got to straighten that out, and I think they will. But I just want to thank the President, because he's been helping us with these monstrous caravans that have been coming up. We had one that was up to over 15,000 people. It's largely broken up. Uh, others have gotten through. And in Tijuana, you have a lot of people staying there. If we didn't have the wall up, and if we didn't have the wall secured and strengthened, they would have walked right through. They'd be welcome to the United States. One of the things we'd save tremendous, uh, just a tremendous amount on, would be sending the military. If we had a wall, we don't need the military, because we'd have a wall. So I'm going to be signing a national emergency. And it's been signed many times before. It's been signed by other presidents. From 1977 or so, it gave the presidents the power. There's rarely been a problem. They signed it. Nobody cares. I guess they weren't very exciting. But nobody cares. They signed it for far less important things in some cases, in many cases. We're talking about an invasion of our country with drugs, with human traffickers, with all types of criminals and gangs. We have some of the greatest people I know. They've been with me from the beginning of my campaign, almost from the first week, the angel moms. Unfortunately, we have new angel moms. One incredible woman just showed me her daughter, who we're talking about killed in the year of 18. I said, I haven't seen you before. She said, no, I'm new. I said, that's too bad. It's too bad. It's so sad. Stand up just for a second. Show how beautiful your girl was. Thank you. I have such respect for these people. Angel moms, angel dads, angel families. I have great respect for these people. These are great people. These are great people. They're fighting for their children that have been killed by people that were illegally in this country. And the press doesn't cover them. They don't want to, incredibly. And they're not treated the way they should be. They're fighting for other people because they don't want ha what happened to their children or husband or anybody. Uh, we have one young lady whose husband, please stand up. Your husband was just killed in Maryland. Incredible man, just killed. Beautiful children won't be seeing their father again. These are brave people. These are people that are, they don't have to be here. They don't have to be doing this. They're doing it for other people. So I just want to thank all of you for being here. Okay, I really do. I want to thank you, incredible people. Last year, 70,000 Americans were killed at least, I think the number is ridiculously low, by drugs, including meth and heroin and cocaine, fentanyl. Now, one of the things that I did with President Xi in China when I met him in Argentina at a summit, before I even started talking about the trade, it was a trade meeting. It went very well. But before I talked about trade, I talked about something more important. I said, listen, we have tremendous amounts of fentanyl coming into our country. Kills tens of thousands of people. I think far more than anybody registers. And I'd love you to declare it a lethal drug and put it on your criminal list. And their criminal list is much tougher than our criminal list. Their criminal list, a drug dealer gets a thing called the death penalty. Our criminal list, a drug dealer gets a thing called, how about a fine? 
And when I asked President Xi, I said, do you have a drug problem? No, no, no. I said, you have 1.4 billion people. What do you mean you have no drug problem? No, we don't have a drug problem. I said, why? Death penalty. We give death penalty to people that sell drugs. End of problem. What do we do? We set up a blue ribbon committees. Lovely men and women. They sit around a table, they have lunch, they eat, they dine, and they waste a lot of time. So if we want to get smart, we can get smart. You can end the drug problem. You can end it a lot faster than you think. But President Xi's agreed to put fentanyl on his list of deadly, deadly drugs. And it's a criminal penalty, and the penalty is death. So that's, frankly, one of the things I'm most excited about in our trade deal. You want to know the truth? I think maybe there's no more important point. We're going to make billions of dollars with this trade deal. It's going to be great for our country and great for China, I hope. Their market's down close to 40 percent. Our market's way up. We've picked up, since my election, trillions of dollars of worth. Trillions, many trillions. And China's lost trillions of dollars. But I want it to be good for China, and I want it to be good for the United States. So we'll see what happens. Uh, China's coming here next week, by the way. They're coming home, the traders. And then uh, China's coming here next week. And then I'll be meeting with President Xi at some point after that to maybe, for some remaining deals, we'll make them directly, one-on-one -on -one ourselves. So we're going to be signing today and registering national emergency. And it's a great thing to do, because we have an invasion of drugs, invasion of gangs, invasion of people, and it's unacceptable. And by signing the national emergency, something signed many times by other presidents, many, many times, President Obama. In fact, we may be using one of the national emergencies that he signed having to do with cartels, criminal cartels. It's a very good emergency that he signed, and we're going to use parts of it in our dealings on cartels. So that would be a second national emergency, but in that case, it's already in place. And what we want, really want to do is simple. It's not like it's complicated. It's very simple. We want to stop drugs from coming into our country. We want to stop criminals and gangs from coming into our country. Nobody's done the job that we've ever done. I mean, nobody's done the job that we've done on the border. And in a way, what I did by creating such a great economy, and if the opposing party got in, this economy would be down the tubes. You know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, but maybe the previous administration. Let me tell you, the previous administration, it was heading south and it was going fast. We would have been down the tubes. The regulations were strangling our country, unnecessary regulations. By creating such a strong economy, you just look at your televisions or see what's going on today, it's through the roof. What happens is more people want to come. So we have far more people trying to get into our country today than probably we've ever had before. And we've done an incredible job in stopping them, but it's a massive number of people. If we had the wall, it would be very easy. We would make up for the cost of the wall just at the cost of the fact that I would be able to have fewer people. We wouldn't need all of this incredible talent, some of whom are sitting in the first row. You wouldn't need all of this incredible talent. We would get, we would get thousands of law enforcement people including Border Patrol. You put them in different areas. You have them doing different things. Law enforcement and Border Patrol. And I want to thank law enforcement, and I want to thank Border Patrol, and I want to thank ICE. ICE is abused by the press and by the Democrats. And by the way, we're going to be taking care of ICE. You know, we talk about the, the new bill. We're going to be taking care of ICE. They wanted to get rid of ICE. And the bill is just the opposite of that. A lot of good things happen. So that's the story. We want to have 
a safe country. I ran on a very simple slogan, make America great again. If you're going to have drugs pouring across the border, if you're going to have human traffickers pouring across the border in areas where we have no protection, in areas where we don't have a barrier, then all right, that's Very President Trump announcing that he will be taking critical well, actions, pulling job. money from a variety of different to locations to pay for the border wall. This after the conflict with Congress over that, and he did not get the border funding there. So he will now use a variety of measures, including a 1976 law that will uh, allow him to find that money. The president's action this morning, uh, he will now get into a fight with the Congress and the law and the uh, judicial branch over whether this is possible. Coverage of this story will continue throughout the day on your local news on this CBS station and on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. There will also be much more tonight on the CBS Evening News with Jeff Glor. We now return you to your local programming. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm John Dickerson, CBS News, New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. So the CBS News special report is wrapped up, but the president has not. His, he's still speaking in the Rose Garden, so let's keep listening. It would have been easy. Not that easy, but it would have been a lot easier. But some people didn't step up. But we're stepping up now. So we have a chance of getting close to $8 billion. Whether it's $8 billion or $2 billion or $1.5 billion, it's going to build a lot of wall. We're getting it done. We're right now in construction with wall in some of the most important areas. And we have renovated a tremendous amount of wall, making it just as good as new. That's where a lot of the money has been spent on renovation. In fact, we were restricted to renovating, which is okay. But we're going to run out of areas that we could renovate pretty soon. So, and we need new wall. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank, in particular, the angel moms and dads for being here. Thank you very much. We have great respect for you. The real country, our real country, the people that really love our country, they love you. So I just want you to know that I know how hard you fight, and I know how hard a fight you're having. I also want to thank all of the law enforcement for the job you do. Uh, believe me, our country loves you, and they respect you greatly. And we're giving you a lot of surplus. We're giving you surplus military equipment, which a lot of people didn't like giving previous to this administration. But uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of surplus equipment. And as we get it, as you know, we send it down, and you have much better protection. Uh, but I really appreciate you being here. So the, uh, the order is signed. And uh, I'll sign the final papers as soon as I get into the Oval Office. And we will have a national emergency. And we will then be sued, and they will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there. And we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake, and we'll win in the Supreme Court. Just like the ban, they sued us in the Ninth Circuit, and we lost, and then we lost in the Appellate Division, and then we went to the Supreme Court, and we won. And it was very interesting, because yesterday they were talking about the ban. Because we have a ban. It's very helpful, Madam Secretary. Is that right? Without the ban, we'd have a bigger problem. We have a ban on certain areas, certain countries, depending on what's going on in the world. And we won. But somebody said, President Trump lost on the ban. Well, he was right. I lost at the lower court. He, ref he didn't say that. We ultimately won at the United States Supreme Court. They didn't want to say that. They didn't want to go that far. They were saying how I lost. The person sitting right up here, Donald Trump lost on the ban. Yeah, I did. And then I lost a second time. You should have said that, too. And then it went to the Supreme Court, and I won. Didn't want to take it that far. But we won on the ban, and we won on other things, too. Uh, the Probably easiest one to win is on declaring a national emergency, because we're declaring it for virtual invasion purposes, drugs, traffickers, and gangs. And one of the things, just to finish, we have removed 
thousands of MS-13 gang monsters. Thousands. They're out of this country. We take them out by the thousands. And they are monsters. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, John, go ahead. Yes, we are. You were prepared. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, a lot of the money... Were you saying I was prepared? What, with the microphone and oh, prepared for questions. I thought you questions. meant I was prepared. I couldn't believe <laughs> no, no, you no, said no, no. that. <laughs> People don't like saying that. You were prepared for questions. I am prepared. I'm always prepared. Uh, a lot of the money uh, that uh, goes to count toward your $8 billion is money that's being reprogrammed uh, in the DOD budget. How, how can you guarantee uh, to military families and to our men and women of the military that none of the money that would be reprogrammed to a wall will take away from other... Uh, technology, other renovations, construction that is yeah. desperately needed in our military. So, John, we had certain funds that are uh, being used at the discretion of generals, at the discretion of the military. Uh, some of them haven't been allocated yet, and some of the generals think that this is more important. Uh, I was speaking to a couple of them. They think this is far more important than what they were going to use it for. I said, what were you going to use it for? And I won't go into details, but it didn't sound too important to me. Plus, if you think, uh, I've gotten $700 billion for the military in year one, and then last year, $716 billion. And we're rebuilding our military, but we have a lot. And under the previous administration, our military was depleted, badly depleted, and they weren't spending — I mean, they had a much less — they had a much smaller amount of money. So when I got $700 billion and then $716 billion, and this year it's going to be pretty big, too, because there's few things more important than our military. You know, I, I'm a big deficit believer in all of that, but before we really start focusing on certain things, we have to build up our military. It was very badly depleted. And we're buying all new jet fighters, all new missiles, all new defensive equipment. We have — we'll soon have a military like we've never had before. But when you think about the kind of numbers you're talking about, so you have 700 billion, 716 billion, when I need 2 billion, 3 billion out of that for a wall, which is a very important instrument, a very important for the military because of the drugs that pour in. And as you know, we have specific rules and regulations where they have drugs and what you can do in order to stop drugs, and that's part of it, too. We're taking a lot of money from that realm, also. But when you have that kind of money going into the military, this is a very, very small amount that we're asking for. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. ABC. Not NBC. I like ABC a little bit more, not much. Come on, ABC. Not much. Pretty close. Uh, Mr. President, what do you say to those, including some of your Republican allies, who say that you are violating the Constitution with this move and setting a bad precedent that will be abused by possibly Democratic presidents in the future? Marco Rubio well, has made Well, not too many point. people, yeah. Not too many people have said that. Uh, but the courts will determine that. Look, I expect to be sued. I shouldn't be sued. Very rarely do you get sued when you do national emergency. And then other people say, oh, if you use it for this, now what are we using it for? We've got to get rid of drugs and gangs and people. It's an invasion. We have an invasion of drugs and criminals coming into our country that we stop, but it's very hard to stop. With a wall, it would be very easy. So I think that we will be very successful in court. I think it's clear. And the people that say we create precedent, well, what do you have, 56 or a lot of times? Well, that's creating precedent. And many of those are far less important than having a border. You don't have a border, you don't have a country. You know, we fight before I got here. We fight all over the world to create borders for countries. But we don't create a border for our own country. So I think what will happen is, sadly, we'll be sued, and sadly, uh, it'll go through a process, and happily, we'll win, I think. Go ahead. Let's go. Let's hear it, NBC. Come Thank on. you, Mr. President. I just want to say, when, uh, in the past, when President Obama tried to use executive action as it related to immigration, you said the whole concept of executive uh, order, it's not the way the country's supposed to be run. You said you're supposed to go through Congress and make a deal. 
Well, you concede that you were unable to make the deal that you had promised in the past and that the deal you're ending up with now from Congress is less than what you could have had no. before a 35-day shutdown. I went through Congress. I made a deal. I got almost $1.4 billion when I wasn't supposed to get $1. Not $1. He's not going to get $1. Well, I got $1.4 billion, but I'm not happy with it. I also got billions and billions of dollars for other things. Port of entries, lots of different things, the purchase of drug equipment, more than we were even requesting. In fact, the primary fight was on the wall. Everything else, we have so much, as I said, I don't know what to do with it. We have so much money. But on the wall, they skimped. So I did, I was successful in that sense, um, but I want to do it faster. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this. But I'd rather do it much faster. And I don't have to do it for the election. I've already done a lot of wall for the election, 2020. And the only reason we're up here talking about this is because of the election. Because they want to try and win an election, which it looks like they're not going to be able to do. And this is one of the ways they think they can possibly win, is by obstruction and a lot of other nonsense. Uh, and I think that uh, I just want to get it done faster. That's all. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank Roberta you. Rampton from Reuters. I wanted to ask about China. Um, do you feel that enough progress has been made in the talks to head off the increase in tariffs scheduled for March 1? Well, you know, you have, you're talking to the wrong person because I happen to like tariffs, okay? I mean, we're taking in billions and billions of dollars in tariffs from China. And our steel industry now is an example. We tax dumped steel. Much of it comes from China at 25 percent. Our steel industry is, is so vibrant now again. They're building plants all over the United States. It's a beautiful thing. And from a defensive standpoint, and from any standpoint, you need steel. You know, you can do without certain industries. Our country cannot do without steel. So I love tariffs, but I also love them to negotiate. And right now, China is paying us billions of dollars a year in tariffs. And I haven't even started. Now, here's the thing. If we make a deal, they won't have to pay. You know, it'll be a whole different story. They won't be paying that, but we'll have a fair deal. There won't be intellectual property theft. There won't be so many other things that have gone on. And no other president has done this. No other president. You know, we didn't have a deal with China. You had the WTO, one of the worst trade deals ever made, probably even worse than NAFTA, if that's believable, which is, you know, hard to believe, because I think NAFTA was just a disaster. It was a total disaster for our country. And now we made the USMCA, which is going to be a terrific, a great deal. And by the way, the USMCA from Mexico, that's the United States, Mexico, Canada, that's where the money's coming from, not directly, but indirectly for the wall. And nobody wants to talk about that, because we're saving billions and billions of dollars a year if Congress approves that deal. Now, they might not want to approve a deal just because they'll say, one of the things I'm thinking of doing, this has never been done before. No matter how good a deal I make with China, if they sell me Beijing for one dollar, if they give me 50 percent of their land and every ship that they've built over the last two years, which is a lot, and they give them to me free, the Democrats will say, what a lousy deal. That's a terrible deal. Like ZTE, I got a billion, more than a billion dollar penalty in a short period of time. And the Democrats said, oh, should have gotten more. When I made that deal, I said, this is incredible. I just got, I got over a billion dollar penalty, plus they had to change their board of directors. They had to change their top management. But they had to pay over a billion dollars. I said, what a deal. It took like a week. And the Democrats didn't even know there was a problem with ZT. I'm the one that fined them. I'm the one that settled it. Over a billion dollars. And President Xi called me, and he said it would be important to him if they could get a deal. And we met a deal, paid, like, in a short period of time. The Democrats went out and said, oh, they should have done better. So what I'm thinking of doing is getting Chuck Schumer, getting Nancy Pelosi, having them bring two or three of their brilliant representatives, 
And we'll all go down together, and what we'll do is we'll negotiate. I'll put them in the room and let them speak up. Because any deal I make with China, if it's the great — it's going to be better than any deal that anybody ever dreamt possible. Or I'm not going to have a deal. It's very simple. But any deal I make with China, Schumer's going to stand up and say, oh, it should have been better. It should have been better. And you know what? That's not acceptable to me. So I'm thinking about doing something uh, very different. I don't think it's ever been — I just don't want to be second-guessed. But that's not even second-guessed. That's called politics. Uh, sadly, I'd probably do the same thing to them, okay? But any deal I make, toward the end, I'm going to bring Schumer, at least offer him, and Pelosi. I'm going to say, please join me on the deal. And by the way, I just see our new Attorney General is sitting in the front row. Please stand up, Bill. Such an easy job he's got. He's got the easiest job in government. Thank you, and congratulations. That was a great vote yesterday. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. In your remarks, sir, you said that you were too new to politics earlier in your administration when you would have preferred that this be done. Is that an admission of how you might be changing on the job? And Well, I'm learning. I mean, I am learning. Don't forget, it's not like I've did, done this for a senator came into my office and said, sir, I've been running for office for 30 years. I've won seven out of seven. I did lose a couple when I was younger. I said, well, I've won one out of one. But, you know, I never did politics before. Now I do politics. I, I will tell you, I'm very disappointed at certain people, particular one, for not having pushed this faster. Are you referring but to Speaker I've Ryan, sir? Who? Speaker Ryan? Uh, let's not talk about it. Okay. What difference does it make? But they should have pushed it faster. They should have pushed it harder. And they didn't. They didn't. Uh, if they would have, it would have been a little bit better. In the meantime, I've built a lot of wall. I have a lot of money, and I built a lot of wall. But it would have been nice to have gotten done. And I would like to see major immigration reform. And maybe that's something we can all work on, Bill, where we all get together and do major immigration reform, not just for a wall, for a barrier, for port of entry, for other things. We have a real problem. We have catch and release. You catch a criminal, and you have to release him. We have so many other things. You have chain migration, where a bad person comes in, brings 22 or 23 or 35 of his family members because he has his mother, his grandmother, his sister, his cousin, his uncle. They're all in. You know what happened on the West Side Highway. That young, wise guy drove over and killed eight people and horribly injured. Nobody talks about that. Horribly, like loss of legs and arms. Going 60 miles an hour, he made a right turn into a park mm -hmm. on the West Side Highway along the Hudson River in New York. He had many people brought in because he was in the United States. It's called chain migration. And then you have the lottery. It's a horror show, because when countries put people into the lottery, they're not putting you in. They're putting some very bad people in the lottery. It's common sense. If I ran a country, and if I have a lottery system of people going to the United States, I'm not going to put in my stars. I'm going to put in people I don't want. The lottery system's a disaster. I'm stuck with it. Mr. President, it could you have, tell wait, us? It should have never happened. Okay. Mr. President, could you tell us to what degree some of the outside conservative voices helped to shape your views on this national emergency? I, I would talk about it. Look, uh, Sean Hannity has been a terrific, terrific uh, supporter of what I do, not of me. If I changed my views, he wouldn't be with me. Rush Limbaugh, I think he's a great guy. He's like, I can speak for three hours without a phone call. Try doing that sometime. For three hours, he speaks. He's got one of the biggest audiences in the history of the world. I mean, this guy is unbelievable. Try speaking for three hours without taking calls. Taking calls is easy. Okay, I'll answer this one, I'll answer that one. He goes for three hours, and he's got an audience that's fantastic. Wait. Uh, they, don't they don't decide policy. In fact, if I went opposite, I mean, they have somebody, Ann Coulter. I don't know her. I hardly know her. I haven't spoken to her in way over a year. But the press loves saying Ann Coulter. Probably if I did speak to her, she'd be very nice. I just don't have the time to speak to her. I would speak to her. I have nothing against her. In fact, I like her for one reason. 
when they asked her, like right at the beginning, who's going to win the election? She said, Donald Trump. And the two people that asked her that question smiled. They said, you're kidding, aren't you? Nope. Donald Trump. So I like her. But she's off the reservation. But anybody that knows her understands that. But I haven't spoken to her. I don't follow her. I don't talk to her. But the press loves to bring up the name Ann Coulter. And you know what? I think she's fine. I think she's good. But I just don't speak to her. Um, Laura's been great. Laura Ingram. Tucker Carlson's been great. I actually have a couple of people on CNN that have been very good. I have some on MSNBC the other day. They did a great report of me. I say, where the hell did that come from? I think it was the only one in over a year. So the crazy thing is, I just had, as you know, Rasmussen, 52 percent in the polls. It's my highest poll number. And people get what we're doing. They get it. They really get it. And I'm honored by it. Yes, Jim Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on uh, this disconnect that we seem to have in this country where you are presenting information about what's happening at the border, calling it an invasion, talking about women with duct tape over their mouths and so on, and yet there's a lot of reporting out there, there's a lot of crime data out there, there's a lot of uh, Department of Homeland Security data out there that shows border crossings at a near record low. Well, uh, that shows us, but un still, undocumented immigrants me, committing crime at lower levels. That shows undocumented cr criminals or undocumented immigrants committing crime at lower levels than native-born Americans. Um, what, what do you I, say I, to you? Don't, you don't really believe that stat. What, do, you, do you really believe what, that what do you stat? Well, Take let me a ask look you at this. our federal prisons. I believe, I believe in facts and statistics. Okay, and data, any more? Quick, let's go. Let me just ask you this. What do you say to your critics who say that you are creating a national emergency? that you're concocting a national emergency here in order to get your wall because I, I you couldn't get it through other moms, ways. What do you think? You think I'm creating something? Ask these incredible women who lost their daughters and their sons. OK? Because your question is a very political question, because you have an agenda. You're CNN. You're fake news. You have an agenda. Uh, the numbers that you gave are wrong. Take a look at our federal prison population. See how many of them percentage-wise, are illegal aliens. Just see. Go ahead and see. It's a fake question. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask yeah. a follow-up? Thank you, Mr. President. Just to follow up on that, unifying uh, crime reporting statistics, numbers from your own Border Patrol, numbers from this government show that the amount of uh, illegal immigrants are down. There is not violence on the border. And that there's most not violence on the there's border? not as much violence oh, really? as let me, you had wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, people let me finish the killed. question, please. Let me finish the question. Two weeks please. ago, twenty six people were killed I in a gunfight on the border. I understand what you're a saying. A mile away from where I went. I under I was there. I understand. That's not the question. The question is do we forget about that? No, I'm not forgetting about it. I'm asking you to clarify where you get your numbers because most of the uh, DEA crimes reporting statistics that we see show that drugs are coming across at the ports of entry, that illegal immigration is down, and the violence is down. Okay. So what do you base okay. your uh, facts let me, let on? Me, come on, let's go. Sort and of, secondly... Sort of, uh, no, no, you get one. Uh, you get well, one. Well, the Ready? second Just question sit down. Is, Wait, sit down. Sit down. Could you, could you please sit answer Sit down. It? You get one um, question. Uh, I please. get my numbers from a lot of sources, like Homeland Security, primarily. And the numbers that I have from Homeland Security are a disaster. And you know what else is a disaster? The numbers that come out of Homeland Security, Kirsten, for the cost that we spend and the money that we lose because of illegal immigration. Billions and billions of dollars a month. Billions and billions of dollars. And it's unnecessary. So your own government stats are wrong, are you saying? No, no. I use many stats. Could you I share those stats, stats with us? Let me tell you, you have stats that are far worse than the ones that I use. But I use many stats, but I also use Homeland Security. All right, next and question. And do you, wait a minute, just a quick uh, follow no. up, Mr. Go, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to bring you back to China for a second. The White House put out a statement today talking about the March 1st deadline. The other day, though, you gave the possibility that maybe this could slide. Are you eyeing a possible extension, 30 days, maybe 60 days? Where does the status uh, there? Or is question. March 1st So it's the a very deadline? big deal. I guess you could say it's like, it must be the biggest deal ever made, if you think. Trade with China. How big does that get? Although, if you look, the USMCA is right up there. But 
It's very complicated. There are many, many points that we're bringing up that nobody ever brought up or thought to bring up, but they're very important because we were on the wrong side of every one of them. There is a possibility that I will extend the date. And if I do that, if I see that we're close to a deal or the deal is going in the right direction, I would do that at the same tariffs that we're charging now. I would not increase the tariffs. Let me also ask you about the debt, sir, because it's gone from a shade under 20 trillion from when yeah. you took office. Now it's a shade over 22 trillion and heading uh, in the wrong direction. What are your plans to, to reverse it? Well, it's all about growth. But before growth I only, really or... focus on that, and you have to remember, President Obama put on more debt on this country than every president in the history of our country combined. So when I took over, we had one man that put on more debt than every other president combined. Combine them all. So you can't be talking about that. But I talk about it because I consider it very important. But first, I have to straighten out the military. The military was depleted. And if we don't have a strong military that hopefully we won't have to use because it's strong, if we don't have a strong military, you don't have to worry about debt. You have bigger problems. So I have to straighten out the military. That's why I did the 700 and 716 billion. But growth will straighten it out. You saw last month the trade deficit went way down. Everybody said, what happened? Well, what's happening is growth. But before I can focus too much on that, a very big expense is military. And we have no choice but to straighten out our Is military. growth the only answer, sir, or is entitlement Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. On North Korea, back on the last summit, you guys came out with a pretty general agreement. Yes. I was wondering what you thought has, uh, you know, been accomplished since the last summit, and then are we going to be seeing anything concrete on okay. denuclearization? Yeah, a lot's been accomplished. We're dealing with them. We're talking to them. When I came into office, I met right there in the Oval Office with President Obama. And I sat in those beautiful chairs, and we talked. It was supposed to be 15 minutes. As you know, it ended up being many times longer than that. And I said, what's the biggest problem? He said, by far, North Korea. And I don't want to speak for him, but I believe he would have gone to war with North Korea. I think he was ready to go to war. In fact, he told me he was so close to starting a big war with North Korea. Now, where are we now? No missiles, no rockets, no nuclear testing. We've learned a lot. But much more importantly than all of it, much more important, much, much more important than that, is we have a great relationship. I have a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un. And I've done a job. In fact, I think I can say this. Prime Minister Abe of Japan gave me the most beautiful copy of a letter that he sent to the people who give out a thing called the Nobel Prize. He said, I have nominated you, or respectfully, on behalf of Japan, I am asking them to give you the Nobel Peace Prize. I said, thank you. Many other people feel that way, too. I'll probably never get it, but that's okay. They gave it to Obama. He didn't even know what he got it for. He was there for about 15 seconds, and he got the Nobel Prize. He said, oh, what did I get it for? With me, I probably will never get it. But if you look at Idlib province in Syria, I stopped the slaughter of perhaps 3 million people. Nobody talk about that. They don't talk about that. Russia and Iran. And Syria, we're going to go in and perhaps destroy 3 million people in order to get 45,000 terrorists. And I heard about it from a woman who had her parents and her brothers living there, and she said, please, please. And I thought, I said, no, it can't happen. What are you talking about? No, they're going to get — and I come home and I read a certain paper where the story was there that they were actually forming to go into — to really — to really do — big destruction. And I put out a statement that you better not do it. And in all fairness to Russia and Iran and Syria, they didn't attack, or they're doing it surgically, at least. Saved a lot of people. We do a lot of good work. This administration does a tremendous job, and we don't get credit for it. But I think the people understand what we do. So Prime Minister Abiy, Gave me, I mean, it's the most beautiful five-letter, five-page letter 
Nobel Prize. He sent it to them. You know why? Because he had rocket ships and he had missiles flying over Japan. And they had alarms going off. You know that. Now, all of a sudden, they feel good. They feel safe. I did that. And it was a very tough dialogue at the beginning. Fire and fury, total annihilation. My button is bigger than yours, and my button works. Remember that? You don't remember that. And people said, Trump is crazy. And you know what it ended up being? A very good relationship. I like him a lot, and he likes me a lot. Nobody else would have done that. The Obama administration couldn't have done it. Number one, they probably wouldn't have done it. And number two, they didn't have the capability to do it. So I just want to thank everybody. I want to wish our new Attorney General great luck and speed and enjoy your life. Bill, good luck. A tremendous reputation. I know you'll do a great job. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we've just been listening to the president uh, speaking in uh, the Rose Garden. So he did declare a national emergency. Uh, it was sort of uh, interwound in a lot of what he had to say um, about what he believes is a crisis at the border and other areas in which he believes that his administration is moving in a positive direction. Um, but here's the thing about the national emergency. What it does is give the president access to additional funding for that border wall. Congress uh, voted about bipartisan uh, vote to pass legislation that would fund the government and in that legislation he was able to get a little bit over about a billion dollars for border security not necessarily for a wall but for border security but the president wants a lot more than that he'd been asking for a little over five billion I think it's 5.7 billion dollars for a border wall so he's going to move forward getting that funding in other places he's going to use an executive order in order to uh, generate um, 600 million from the Treasury uh, Department, uh, part of their drug for forfeiture um, account, $2.5 billion from the Department of Defense. But this executive order will give him access to even more money, about $3.5 billion from the military. And he was asked because, you know, one of the things that the president uh, campaigned on was his support of the military. His And one of the things that he frequently brags about, in fact, he did that here uh, in uh, in his uh, speech, was the amount of money that he's able has been able to generate generate for the military he, and he was asked whether or not he could guarantee that this money that he's taking away from the military budget would not have funded something else that was maybe a little more important. This is money that's in um, uh, an account sort of allotted for military construction, uh, but it cannot be allotted for a specific construction project. So we've got Paula Reed. She's been standing by, by in uh, the Rose Garden for us. Uh, oh, and Nancy Cordes too. Great. I love it. I got both of you guys, you guys uh, standing by. So, ladies, you know, one of the things that I thought was sort of interesting about this speech is it didn't actually sound like a very formal announcement of a national emergency. He almost seemed to sort of want to, I don't know, Apollo, sort of weave it into all the other accomplishments and everything else that's happening. And then he sort of threw in, well, I'm going to declare this national emergency. I'm going to sign it somewhere else. That's right. He could barely contain his contempt for this whole proceeding. It's interesting. I remember in law school, and marie they used to teach us that if your client has a bad fact, try to sandwich it in between some good ones. And that's what I felt like he was doing here at the beginning, he sort of went through his greatest hits. He talked about China. He talked about North Korea. He even recalled his recent rally in El Paso. And then he kind of mentioned that he was going to declare a national emergency. And one of the reasons he doesn't want to draw too much attention to this is because this is arguably the worst deal uh, that has been presented to him. It has been blasted by conservatives. And many people believe that his efforts to pursue executive action as a way to get these additional billions of dollars that is going to be held up in the courts and that will ultimately not be successful. So it seemed this really was and what he wanted to talk about when he came out today. Yeah, in fact, he sort of just said, so I'm declaring this national emergency and there's going to be, you know, legal challenges and it's probably going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. He sort of sort of ran down what he sees in his future. And Nancy, in fact, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer wasted no time sort of uh, releasing their official um, uh, uh, official uh, critique of this announcement. Mm -hmm. And right off the top, I'm just looking at um, the official document. It says the president's unlawful declaration over a crisis that does not exist is a great violence to our constitutional. In fact, Nancy, that's what a lot of the critics say, that this is a violation of the Constitution. 
Right, they accused him of stealing from urgently needed defense funds. And here is uh, really the biggest news to come out of that statement, Anne-Marie. They said that Congress will defend its constitutional authority in Congress, in the courts, and in the public using every remedy available. So you remember yesterday when we asked Nancy Pelosi, are you going to go to court over this? And she said, I may. Uh, I'm considering it. Well, now we have the answer. She uh, is planning to go through the legal system, as the president himself predicted, uh, to make the case that this is not, in fact, a national emergency and that the president is overstepping his authority. And he may have handed those Democratic lawyers a huge gift right in the middle of his press conference. It was when he said, Anne-Marie, uh, I didn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have built the wall much slower, but I'd rather do it much faster. Well, uh, you could almost see the, the lawyers at DOJ, you know, their heads just spinning off their axis because mm -hmm. they are going to be the ones who have to defend this national emergency. And there you have the president saying, actually, I didn't really need to do it. I just I just want to do it this way because I want to build my wall faster. That's going to make it uh, much more difficult for government lawyers to make the case that this is, in fact, an emergency that he's taking action on. Oh, that is so interesting, Nancy. Paula, did you did that sort of jump out at you as well, considering you oh. are an attorney? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, Nancy is absolutely right. They were already going to have a difficult time in court. Justice Department lawyers have told me that they expected that this will likely be blocked by a nationwide injunction and that it is going to be difficult to prevail on the national emergency. Now, there are other funds that he is pursuing that don't necessarily require a national emergency. They may be more successful there. They're already going to have trouble arguing that there is exigency or that they should be using this particular power, which is meant for the president to move quickly when Congress can't move quickly enough. But now the president making these comments here in the Rose Garden just makes their case all the more difficult. And Nancy, here's the thing. We expect to hear pushback from the Democrats. But the president right. also had been receiving pushback from his own party when he started floating the idea of a national emergency. Right. And it's several of those Republicans have reiterated their opposition even after it became official yesterday that he was going to declare this national emergency. And the challenge for Republicans and the reason that they've been warning him for weeks not to go this route is that they know uh, that politically Democrats have an ace up their sleeve, which is uh, ace up their sleeve, which is that in the House, uh, Democrats will be able to file something called a joint resolution to terminate emergency status, um, basically saying this uh, national emergency is invalid, uh, the president didn't have a right to declare one, and it'll pass in the House because the House is uh, controlled by Democrats. But uh, because this is a joint resolution, the Senate must take it up within about two and a half weeks after it passes the House. Normally, the Senate could ignore legislation that comes over from the House if Republicans didn't want to bring it out. In this case, they have to do so. And you can see a scenario, Anne-Marie, where because there are uh, a number of Republicans who are already on record opposing this national emergency, I'm talking about Susan Collins of Maine, Marco Rubio of Florida, Rand Paul of Kentucky, just to name a few, and Republicans have a very small majority in the Senate, you could see a scenario where the House and Senate both pass this joint resolution to terminate emergency status. Now, the president has the power to veto that joint resolution, and there probably aren't the votes in Congress, as far as we know, to override that veto, but it still sends a pretty powerful message when all of Congress is officially rebuking his decision to declare a national emergency. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. And what I think about is not only sort of the president receiving pushback from his own party, but also, you know, when you look at the latest polls, it's not like the American people are necessarily in favor of declaring a national emergency for for the border wall. And I, I got I wonder, Paula, if, you know, that is a concern at the White House that they're certainly they're, you know, they're not getting support from the Democrats. There's some lack of support in some areas from some Republicans. But then, you know, the American people aren't that crazy about it either. 
That's right, but the president also has to specifically consider his base as he returns to the campaign trail in 2020. He can't show up to campaign rallies with nothing to show uh, for his signature campaign promise. So here, uh, top Republican lawmakers were able to kind of convince the president that this was a win. This was a down payment. Now he'll pursue executive action and pursue a national emergency declaration to get the money he wants. And the White House, you know, they fully expect there'll be legal challenges, but they weren't exactly willing to defend uh, or explain exactly how they're going to defend this. Instead, they painted this as a common tool, something presidents have used about 30 times over the past 40 years. But of course, what is unusual here is using it for something like a wall. When traditionally, a uh, national emergency has been declared for something like 9-11 or H1N1 or uh, election interference. So it will be difficult for the larger American population to really buy this plan. But the president is considering his base and the fact that he only got about a quarter of the money he needs for the wall from his actual appropriations bill that he's going to sign. So, Paul, I want to talk. Marie, just yeah, to sorry, go ahead, Nancy. Really quickly, um, CBS News actually polled on this question fairly recently. And, and while two thirds of Americans say that they uh, oppose the president declaring a national emergency, three quarters of Republicans said they do want him to declare a national emergency. And so those are the numbers that are in his head as right. he's deciding to do this. And, and that's what creates a real challenge for Republicans as they're going to have to decide what to do when Democrats force them to go on the record and vote one way or the other. Uh, do they stand by the president and their base or do they stand by this uh, philosophy of reducing executive power that they were so strongly behind and advocated for eight years while President Obama was in power? It's so true. And, and Paula, you know, this idea of a national emergency, I was sort of looking through the list of national emergencies and most of them have ended. They sort of have an end time. There are several that are kind of ongoing, but those ones don't seem to be the types of national emergencies that would require a substantial amount of funding, never ending funding, but something like a border wall, which not only has to be built, but then ultimately maintained. We could be talking about a national emergency that doesn't really have an end date, doesn't sunset. That's right. And earlier today, before this press conference, administration officials could not even tell us when construction would begin. But it's unclear if the president will ever actually get his hands on this money. As we said repeatedly, this will be challenged in court. Uh, the Justice Department tells me they are expecting, likely, a nationwide injunction that will prevent the president from even getting this money. So in terms of construction starting, even if the president prevailed at the Supreme Court, on this issue, they then face another round of legal challenges from landowners along the border. So it's going to be a long time before they even get this money, never mind how long they'll need to build. Right. So, Paula, I know that you need to go. So thanks a lot for joining us so quickly yeah. after uh, the president spoke. And, Nancy, before I let you go, I just want to sort of, uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier, this idea of, st of uh, setting a precedent that, uh, you know, if the president can de declare a national emergency now for a border wall, when there are all sorts of statistics that indicate that the number of of illegal crossings has continued to go down over the past uh, 20 years or so that uh, you know when it comes to illegal drugs coming into this country most often though the president disputed that uh, in his in his remarks uh, just now but you know most often we're talking about uh, drugs being smuggled in at uh, mm -hmm. legal border crossings and often when we talk about people here in this country that are undocumented the vast right. majority have entered the country legally and overstayed their legal visas, and that's how they're why they're here. But when you talk about declaring a national emergency for something like this in the future, it sort of opens up future presidents to declare national emo emergencies for all types of things, maybe some things the Republicans may not be very pleased with. Right, and I think that no one disputes the fact that uh, drugs coming illegally into this country is a problem and a significant problem, and it leads to uh, and it leads to health problems and it leads to death in some cases. So nobody disputes that. What they do dispute is that it falls under the category of a national emergency. And if you think back to other national emergencies that have been declared, whether it had to do with 9/11, whether it had to do with Hurricane Katrina, or any number of uh, natural disasters. Uh, there is rarely any debate 
here on Capitol Hill or more broadly in Washington about whether it is an emergency or not. People tend to agree. So we're kind of in uncharted territory here where you've got the president and some of his allies arguing this is absolutely a national emergency. And then you've got others, including some in his own party, saying, no, it's not. And beyond that, what they are saying is, you know, if we are now sort of opening this door to a president kind of deciding on his own without uh, a green, more, more broad uh, agreement in Washington about what a national emergency is, what is to stop a Democratic president down the line um, from declaring that climate change is a national emergency or that gun violence is a national emergency or that, um, you know, people who, who aren't insured is a national emergency. I mean, any number of Democratic priorities, you could see a Democratic president taking that same approach. Not to say that it's going to happen, mm -hmm. but what Republicans say is, you know, once, once you open this door, you don't know who else is going to walk through it, and perhaps we don't want to take that chance. But obviously, that's an opinion that uh, the president was well aware of before he ultimately made this decision that he was going to declare a national emergency. And what's so interesting, Anne-Marie, is that Republican leaders who were on record saying that they really didn't favor this approach had a really quick about face yesterday, suddenly saying this is a humanitarian and security crisis. We back the president. We support him. And, you know, the reason is there were, there were really two reasons. One is uh, they, they faced a pretty difficult choice. Either, you know, once the president says he's going to do this, either they get behind him or they look like they're against a wall. And that's uh, something that's not very popular with their own base. And they really wanted him to sign this uh, border security p deal because government funding was set to run out for several agencies at midnight tonight if he didn't sign it and they really did not want to get on his bad side at this critical time. Yeah, and when you think about the fact that, you know, the president, we all remember that uh, that uh, press conference with Nancy, with, I'm uh, sorry, with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer where the president said, mm -hmm. I will own a government shutdown. Uh, and right. I'm pretty sure, you know, Republicans uh, across the Capitol um, cringed when they heard that we had this government shutdown. It wasn't a good look. I'm sure they mm -hmm. were not looking forward to another one. So, and so, yeah, right. so the good news is, which is something that we're, none of us are really talking about right now, is yes, right. the government has been funded. It's been funded until I think uh, perhaps September, is it? So at least yes. we know that and those 800,000 people who went without a paycheck for a month know that they do not have to worry for the foreseeable future. However, <laughs> there is another fight. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but there is another fight looming because Congress is going to need to raise the debt ceiling uh, within the next couple of months. You probably saw uh, the news a couple days ago. I'm sure you reported on it yeah. that uh, we have now surpassed uh, a, a, a debt in this country of $22 trillion. Uh, Congress will need to lift the debt ceiling um, so that the U.S. can accumulate more debt. The president will need to sign it. and. Uh, so that sets up yet another possibility for a fight if he balks at signing it or if he says he wants something else in exchange for it. So, uh, yes, we're, we're out of the funding um, fight, but we could be heading into another one with potential shutdown consequences coming up soon. Ugh, it's Groundhog Day. Nancy, Sorry. thank you so much. That's OK. <laughs> That's <welcome>. OK. <laughs> At least it's Friday. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so we are uh, going to cover this, the latest announcement for the president, uh, declaring a national emergency to fund that border wall, as well as the other news stories of the day. So stick around. You're streaming CBSN.